Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've never really considered myself a vengeful person. Sure, I can hold a grudge with the best of them, but going out of my way to get revenge usually seems like more trouble than it's worth. But sometimes, the universe just throws certain opportunities your way that are too good to pass up. I was on my way to meet up with some friends at a bar downtown. This particular bar only has street parking and it can be tricky to find a spot on weekend nights. As I was driving around looking for a space, I noticed a shiny BMW parked right in the middle of the street, blocking traffic in both directions. I couldn't believe someone would just leave their car sitting there like that. After a few minutes of honking and trying to squeeze around the BMW, the driver finally emerged from the bar. This young guy, probably in his early 20s, strolled up to the car without a care in the world. He was dressed in designer clothes and just oozed arrogance. I rolled down my window to say something to him, but he shot me a dismissive look before getting in his car and driving away, forcing me to back up to let him through. As he drove past, I noticed his vanity license plate read KNGJMS. King James? Seriously? This dude was clearly very full of himself. I managed to find a tight parking spot a few blocks away from the bar, all the while fuming over that interaction. Who did this punk think he was, blocking traffic and acting like he owned the place? The more I thought about it, the more irritated I got. When I met up with my friends, I told them the story and how obnoxious that guy was. Let's get some payback, my friend Liam said enthusiastically. Now Liam has always been the troublemaker in our group. Usually I'm the voice of reason trying to talk him out of his crazy ideas, but this time I admit I was eager to plot a little revenge. We started brainstorming ways we could teach this King James a lesson, Slashing his tires seemed a bit extreme, plus we didn't want to destroy property and end up with a criminal charge. Spray painting his car also crossed a line, but what we landed on was something deliciously petty. We figured King James would stay at the bar until close, so we had some time to set our plan in motion. Liam went around the block, gathering up every traffic cone, garbage can, and anything else movable that could block a parked car. Meanwhile, I stood back on the lookout for the BMW. Luckily, the street stayed busy, so no new parking spots opened up near the bar. Around 1.30 a.m., patrons started pouring out of the bar as closing time neared. And sure enough, out strutted King James. He looked pretty tipsy as he fumbled around his pockets for his keys. Liam and I watched from down the block as he approached his car. As soon as he got in and pulled away, we sprang into action. Liam ran over and started surrounding the BMW's parking spot with the traffic cones and trash cans. It was a tight fit, but he managed to completely box in the area. Then we both ducked behind a dumpster and waited for our victim's return. About 15 minutes later, the shiny BMW came rolling back down the street with King James at the wheel. He looked puzzled when he couldn't just pull right back into the spot he had before. Peering out confused, he inched the car forward until he bumped one of the cones. I had to stifle a laugh watching him get out and assess the situation, clearly growing more agitated by the second. Drunk and oblivious, it didn't even dawn on him that someone did this on purpose. King James started trying to move the cones and garbage cans out of the way, but with his impaired state, he ended up just knocking most of them over with the car. The ones he successfully moved, Liam just snuck out and put back in place while James was moving the car again. This went on for a solid 20 minutes. By this point we were nearly crying with laughter. Watching this self-important jerk bumble around in utter bewilderment, getting increasingly frustrated, was just priceless. The grand finale came when James finally lost his cool. Letting out an angry shout, he slammed the car into park right in the middle of the narrow street. He got out, and now tried moving the obstacles more aggressively, but the nearby dumpster prevented him from clearing a path. After this final failed attempt, King James let loose and started kicking the trash can violently. This caused it to tip over and send garbage spilling everywhere. He then stormed off down the street, leaving his car sitting in the road blocking traffic once again. Liam and I were doubled over, barely able to contain ourselves. As the disgruntled king disappeared from sight, we came out from our hiding spot to survey the damage. The street was littered with traffic cones, dented trash cans, and piles of garbage. We quickly dragged everything back onto the sidewalk before any cars came through. Then we took some final photos of that pretentious BMW stranded in its makeshift prison. 
Just to add insult to injury, I pulled out a notebook and scribbled a quick note which I left under the BMW's windshield wiper. It read, Dear King James, sorry about the parking situation, but we just wanted to remind you that you're not the king of this street. Please don't block traffic and act like you own the place next time. XOXO, your loyal subjects. Liam and I headed home satisfied that we had served up some righteous justice. For the next week, we kept checking online to see if our new friend King James had posted any angry rants about the bizarre parking vandalization, but sadly there were no entertaining tirades, just the sweet memory of watching an arrogant jerk finally get a taste of humble pie. I'm usually not one for revenge, but I consider our little late-night lesson a public service to the people of our city. So to any other entitled Karens out there blocking traffic and acting above the law, beware. Some fed-up citizens just might give you a taste of your own medicine. The next one is a pro-revenge story. I worked for a company that provides specialized equipment used in manufacturing. To protect my anonymity, I'll have to be vague about what exactly this machine does. During my time working in this field, I got to know many clients who would need these machines installed and serviced. One of these customers we'll call Jake. I later left the company too for a different job, but Jake apparently kept my number. One afternoon, I got a call from Jake that they wanted a new unit installing and another unit needed maintenance and wanted to know if I was available. I let him know that I left the company, but that I could pass him on to someone who could help. He tells me he'll pay 2x my current rate to install the unit over the weekend. He lets me know that the company has increased the rates for installation and the company just can't afford it. The instructions they sent over just aren't clear enough and their engineers are scratching their heads trying to figure it out. He begs me to consider it and I agree. For more context, installing this unit can take a good few hours or up to a day on your own. The company gives you two options. You can either pay for an engineer to come and install it, or you can save money and they will send instructions so the customer's own engineers can install it. The instructions aren't easy to follow and it's company policy that if someone has started to install the equipment, the supplier wouldn't get involved since they couldn't verify that any of the pieces were broken. This will be important later. I drive down on the weekend and they show me the boxes of equipment. I set to work and I make good progress installing the unit. Around six hours in and I'm stopped by Jake who greets me. I let him know I'm nearly finished and he tells me, Sorry, but they just don't have the budget to pay you. He understand my frustration, but his engineers can take it from here. To say I was frustrated was an understatement. I wanted revenge. There's a small button inside the unit that changes the unit into test mode. This is done to perform maintain on the unit, but it's impossible to configure the unit with this button pressed. It's only possible to reach this button using a pin so it's not easily pressed during installation. Because of this, the installation instructions don't mention it. There's no real way of telling the equipment is in test mode. It just won't work normally. I think you can guess where this is going. I click the button, collect my things, and leave. Monday morning I get a call from Jake. I declined. I knew my old company wouldn't get involved since I already started installing the unit. I knew his engineers would never figure it out. I just had to let him stew. A few days later, with many missed calls, I finally pick up. Jake is furious. He asks me where the hell I've been and why I haven't been picking up the phone. He tells me they can't figure it out how to configure the machine and they need my help. I tell him, why is this my problem? You won't pay me. He told me he was sorry and they would work something out if I could get there as soon as possible. I told him, oh no, you're going to pay me pound 7,000 up front before I do anything. I'd never felt this powerful before. He screamed at me for a bit and hung up. He called back a day later after saying he's sorry for how he acted and said that if I could come fix it, he would pay me, in a totally defeated tone. He tried to fight it saying he'll pay when I was done, but I was having none of it. After a bit of back and forth, he agrees to pay me. The money hit my account and I came in the next day. The look of confusion over his face when I took out a pin and changed the unit from test mode was priceless. It was even more priceless seeing his reaction to me packing up my tools and leaving after only 20 minutes of configuring. Easiest 7,000 pounds I'd ever made. Don't try to mess with a professional problem solver. The next one is a petty revenge story, so there I was driving on the highway, right? An ambulance was coming from the other side with all its lights flashing. I slowed down a bit just to see if it was going to turn my way to go down the road I was coming up on that was to my right. It didn't. No biggie, right? 
But then I noticed in my rearview mirror this young dude and his girlfriend behind me, making rude gestures and acting all tough. He started tailgating me while flipping me off and doing the pinch hand signal implying I have a small dick. Honestly, it was more funny than annoying because I was just trying to do the right thing for the ambulance. We were coming up to a red light with two lanes, and I figured, why not have a little fun? I slowed down to see which lane they'd pick, so they'd end up right next to me. When they did, I rolled down my window ready for some kind of showdown, but suddenly, they wouldn't even look at me, just stared straight ahead like I wasn't there. Kinda reminded me of those dog videos where there's a gate between two dogs, and they're barking like crazy at each other like they're ready to attack, then the gate opens and the dogs stop. The guy was driving a nice BMW, and I remembered seeing a cop up the road earlier because I was coming that way earlier on. So I got this idea which was perfect as long as the cop was still there. I switched my car into sport mode, revved the engine a bit, making it look like I was up for a race. The light turned green and we both went for it. I knew I couldn't beat a BMW, but I knew by the kind of car his parents probably bought him, he was going to try and show off to his GF. And besides, I don't condone racing at all, it's dangerous and dumb, so that wasn't my intention. I only sped up to the speed limit and stayed right at it. They ended up flipping me off as they went by. But then they passed the cop at like 70 miles per hour. I was so happy when I saw that cop was still in that same spot. I couldn't stop laughing when I saw the cop lights turn on and he started going after them. I pulled into a spot near where the he had been to grab a coffee. A bit later, I drove past them, and right behind them was a beautiful sight. They were stopped on the side of the highway with the cops right behind them. I made sure to slow down as much as I could so they would see me and raised my coffee up as I passed. They didn't notice me, but the feeling I had of my petty revenge, I've never felt so alive. The next one is a malicious compliance story. Several years ago, I coached a kid's soccer team. It was a community recreation league with volunteer coaches with a focus on fun and equal playing time. There were two fields next to a school. The third field is a two-minute walk away and hidden behind a thick stand of trees invisible from the two fields. One would never know it was there, but did have a small parking lot next to it, accessible only by a rarely used, poorly maintained back lane. Most people would park in the school lot and walk the two minutes along the path through the trees. The two fields next to the school were typical school fields, not particularly well-maintained, uneven, and definitely not regulation-sized typical school fields. The third field was regulation-sized, perfectly maintained, had new bleachers, and was maintained like a professional field with regular waterings, cutting, and seeding. It was the groundskeeper's pride and joy. It was the first day of a new season, and my team of ten-year-olds, the brown pandas, our shirts were brown with pandas on them, showed up for our first practice. Except there was another team on our assigned field, a team of talented players with matching socks and shorts, were all wearing cleats and in their late teens. I approached the coach and explained that he was on our field, and that his field was a two-minute walk away down the path. He politely told me to take a hike. He was there first, and that was that. So not looking for a confrontation, I took my team to the really nice field. The parents had bleachers to sit in and we had a great time on the big boy field. After the practice, the groundskeeper convener asked me why we were practicing on this field. I told her what happened with the other coach. She told me she asked the other coach to switch field also. He told her to get stuffed and that was his field. Two days later at our second practice, his team was on our field again. The convener called me over to talk to her and the other coach. She stated, just to confirm for the rest of the season you are switching fields with the brown pandas on the far field and your team on this field here? Yeah, this is our field and the little kids will be on the far field. He looked at us arrogantly. Fine by me. I stated grabbed my big net sack of balls and trudged over to the professional field. Two glorious weeks passed when during practice the other coach came over with his team and saw our field. He approached me and told me that we needed to switch fields. I laughed in his face. Go get the convener over so we can discuss. I turned my back on him and probably did something like tie a kid's shoe or dry some tears. Remember, they were ten-year-olds. His team started trying to use our field. One of the brown pandas was scared of the bigger kids and started crying. A couple of parents stepped in and started shooing them away before one of the ten-year-olds got hurt. He returned with his entire team and the convener. She was beaming. She asked him if he remembered our conversation of two weeks ago. He started to argue. 
She told him that we were keeping with the terms of that agreement and to go back to his own field. Go on, Scoot, I remember her saying. We had our first game the next week. All the brown panda parents were in attendance watching their children playing soccer on a beautiful field with semi-comfortable seating and a working scoreboard. As we left, we walked by the other team playing on a muddy, undersized field. They eventually changed their game dates and time so they could use the big field, but had to practice on the old field. The brown pandas never had to set foot on the older field all season. The next one is an entitled people story. Working at the office could be tough sometimes, but I always tried to keep my head down and focus on doing my job the best I could. That all got a little harder when Ted started working in the cube next to mine. From day one, Ted rubbed me the wrong way. He strolled in late on his first day, coffee in hand, looking half asleep. He spent more time chatting with the folks around us than booting up his computer or reviewing his new hire paperwork. I could tell already this guy put socializing above working. Over the next few weeks, it became clear Ted was not model employee material. He took extra long lunch breaks, made personal calls from his desk, and always seemed to be discussing last night's TV shows and sports games with the others nearby. I could hear him over the divider going on about some reality show drama, rather than the work we were supposed to be doing. Ted also had no sense of professional workplace boundaries. He thought nothing of showing off crude internet memes and inappropriate videos at full volume. More than once I had to ask him to turn it down or use headphones when he blasted offensive content. He just laughed it off like I was the weird one for objecting. The gossiping was non-stop too. He would gossip about co-workers, clients, even his own friends and family. I made sure never to tell Ted anything personal, since he could not seem to keep a secret. One day I mentioned an annoying disagreement I had with my mother recently. Not an hour later, she was calling me at work, chewing me out, because Ted had called her to get her side of the story. I was livid that he had taken it upon himself to discuss my private business and give my mom my work number without permission. Things went from annoying to inappropriate when packages started arriving at Ted's desk emblazoned with explicit images. Ted made no attempt to hide the materials and more than once I caught a glimpse of naked bodies when I glanced over. I asked him politely yet firmly multiple times to keep that stuff at home, but the boxes kept coming. After months of trying to ignore Ted's antics, I finally had to lodge a formal complaint when I arrived at work early one day to find Ted using his phone to take pictures of papers left on my desk. He claimed he was just curious what I was working on, but I knew he was looking for gossip material and I felt completely violated. This was the last straw. Ted received a stern warning from our manager about his inappropriate conduct, especially the snooping through my personal workspace. For a few weeks afterwards, Ted kept his head down and his mouth shut actually doing his job for once. But it did not last long. Before long, Ted was back to his old ways, talking trash about our new office policies and complaining loudly about every task he was assigned. He started showing up late and taking extra days off, with excuses that rang hollow. I even heard him making lewd comments to our young female intern. It was clear he had no respect for workplace rules or basic professionalism. A few months later, a second complaint landed Ted in hot water again. This time, the manager revoked his internet access and monitored his daily activities. Ted was furious at me, assuming I had reported him again. In truth, others had finally had enough of his unprofessionalism too. With disciplinary action looming, Ted resigned before he could be terminated. I can't say I was sad to see him go. Sometime later, I ran into Ted at a local coffee shop. He made a beeline for my table, plopping into the seat across from me uninvited. I prepared for snide comments or conspiracy theories about why he had been forced out, but Ted instead wanted to gossip about former co-workers and fish for office rumors. When I did not engage with his attempts at trash talk, he quickly grew bored. Soon Ted was scanning the room for more interesting conversational partners. I cannot say I was disappointed when he left my table to continue his search. Ted clearly had not changed, but I had. I realized his toxic attitude and unprofessional behavior were his own issues to deal with, and I was better off spending my energy focusing on maintaining a strong work ethic rather than getting mixed up in the distractions and drama Ted surrounded himself with. In the end, his laziness and lack of respect for others had led to his own downfall. I knew the best revenge was living well, keeping my head down and continuing to build my career. 
wherever Ted ended up next, I hope for his co-worker's sake that he finally learned how to conduct himself appropriately in a professional setting. If not, I didn't doubt he would eventually burn that bridge too. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.